So I better do that. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks, thanks for coming. We are um, we are here for our our 59th webinar of the series. Uh, really excited about this one. Look, been looking forward to this one for a while. I've uh, known Bob for a for, for a little bit, right? And uh, and and we've been uh, chatting back and forth. And I'm uh, just a huge fan of uh, of a book that he wrote. And uh, but we're. Uh, uh, so we're going to do this one, and, and, and our guest is Bob Knox. Uh, the book is a practical guide to race car data analysis. And um, but there's so much more to Bob. And and uh, so yeah, yeah, the book we're going to talk about the book because I think all of you will find it uh, interesting as I do as well. But uh, th th there's more to the man. So we're uh, we're going to have a little bit of a chat. We're going to talk a little bit about you know maybe some um, uh, some current data analysis and and engineering tools that uh, that he that he's. Uh, uh, doing currently and and uh, and plus a hundred other things obviously but uh, looking forward to having our chat welcome Bob thank, thanks for coming I appreciate it uh, I know it's a little bit of work and, uh, and and time out of your busy day I'm, I'm glad you're here welcome oh, this is awesome glad to do it absolutely been looking forward to it for a while the uh, we're, we're starting kind of a, uh, a a bit of a run with um, um, uh, Data acquisition books and their and their authors and 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 to chat about them and just get even even a deeper feel of of uh, you know, some of the training and support and 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 information that's out there for all of you guys. So so we will um, we will uh, we will start with Bob and then we'll uh, we'll continue on with some other ones in the in just in the coming weeks. So be be ready for that. So the um, the uh, first thing I'd like to do is 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 maybe give a quick introduction. I you know. Um, We've been chatting back and forth with Bob. Just as a as a quick note, um, we have done uh, until the the pandemic stuff. We we were doing weekly on site seminars um, of the AIM products and the software and and data acquisition as a whole all over all over North America. And um, and early on, I bought this book um, you know, right when it came out. I think it came out in 2011, if, if I if I recall. And I bought the book and, um, and, and started to, and I jumped on an airplane. I bought the book somewhere. Uh, it got to me at least somewhere on the, on the East Coast. And, uh, and I ended up on a flight coming cross country back, back home after a, 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 a seminar. And, uh, and I sat down in my seat and I said, okay, let's, and I opened it up and I read that book cover to cover in one sitting uh, on an airplane, you know, flying across the country. And, um, and I'm not a big reader that way. I, I tend to, you know, uh, either fall asleep or, or, or get a little bit bored. The book is written in such a way that uh, what I enjoyed about it was that it, uh, it kind of walked me through a process. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. But the, uh, uh, that's how I got to know a little bit more about Bob was by picking up the book. And then Bob was nice enough to, uh, to, to make sure we got a couple of copies that I have taken to almost all seminars and just throw them out on the table. People could look at it and, uh, and, and, and learn a little bit more and, and purchase it if they, if they felt that it was something that uh, could add value to their data analysis. So it, uh, we've known each other on that side uh, for a while. And um, uh, Bob's been a, a, around motorsports for a long time. I had, a, I had the, uh, the pleasure of having a conversation the other day with him and we and we talked about different things he's been involved in motorsports for over 40 years and and um, a couple things that we will actually dig into a little bit deeper he was an open wheel racer and, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that and he started to get into data in, in eight, 1989 as it says here and then did some you know life life happened and did some things and then uh, in 2004 he wanted to get back into it and and started to to freelance as a data engineer and in the classes that you you see there, and um, uh, also, and then and then kind of a a tie together. We didn't talk about this much the other day, but uh, write, writes his own software for his role as a data engineer. It's uh, it, it's something that um, that I think you're going to see on on on, uh, and you probably already know that preparation is everything, right? So you you end up with you've got this task of uh, engineering the car or, or or getting the most out of your data analysis experience and boy doing everything you can to be able to get it where you you you, you get your data out of the car and you get answers to what you need as fast as possible is preparation bob has done that with some uh, writing of some from his, some software which is kind of an interesting thing as well 
So the, you know, that's the that's the that's the thirty thousand view. I'd like Bob to to take a few minutes, talk about uh, uh, maybe those bullets give you a uh, a place to start, but give us a little bit of a background on on you and how you got involved in this uh, this crazy world. How did how did you become a lifer into this crazy world of <laughs> motorsports? Well, very indirectly. Um, I went to college, went to law school, and I thought that was what my life was going to be about. And after I started practicing law, a friend said, I know some kid who has this new uh, formula car, because I'd been watching sports car racing at Laguna Seca, if Dave Arkin's there, Katati, <laughs> all kinds of interesting places. And so I was really interested. And I went down to Laguna Seca, and there was a kid there with a brand new Lotus 51 Formula Ford, first thing that ever came into the US. It was in the black and gold JPS livery. Ooh, it was gorgeous. just gorgeous. I fell in love. <laughs> yeah, I, I came into a small amount of money. I was going to start my real estate empire with it. But instead, I went to the Bob Bondurant Driving School at Ontario Motor Speedway, which is no longer there. Yeah. I came home, called Pierre Phillips in Portland, Oregon, and, and ordered a brand new Titan Mark VI. And that was the beginning of my life. The rest of my life has been spent. A lot of a lot of my career choices have been based on how can I make enough money to go play with the things that I love. So yeah, I, I raced Formula Ford for from 1972 through 1975 and 1976. <laughs> Excuse me, I went to England and raced um, what they called Super Ford, but it was basically the two liter two liter Pinto Anno, Pinto engine and what we call here Formula Continental or F2000. I worked for Hawk Racing Cars, worked with Adrian Renard. It was all very interesting. Oh, very cool. Came back, more Formula Ford, and then did one year of the USAC Pro F2000 series. <clears throat> in 1992, did the part of the SCCA Pro F2000 series in 1993. Last year of club racing, decided I needed to think about the future a little bit more, so I stopped racing, and then I just retired from everything at the end of 1996. Traveled on a sailboat for a number of years. And after I got back in the US, some old friends said, come help us at the races, which I did. And then some of you may remember Gib Gibson, Gibby. Um, he called me up one day and said, I'm working for a prep shop and we have data systems and nobody knows what to do. You know how to do this stuff, come on. And I, it was supposed to be four weekends a year and now it's become a full-time <laughs> thing for me. It's, but that a, was sli it's a slippery slope motorsports, isn't it? It, it always gets yeah. you. And, and, and to give credit where credit is due, um, I had met Gibby in 1989 at the SCCA runoffs at Road Atlanta, but I also met another guy that I didn't have much contact with for a long time, Joe Stamola, who was then Stamola racing engines, mostly Formula Ford. But after I started doing this data stuff in 2004, I met Joe again. And I have to say that he is the man who shoved me up the ladder um, into professional racing. Yeah. And uh, you know, he died in 2010 and that was a great loss to all of us. But without him, I wouldn't be sitting here be, being able to talk about this stuff. <laughs> At, so, least, at least in this role, right? Yeah. Uh, just a little bit about what, what writing software for your role as a data engineer. What uh, do you, are you just writing some small things to to work internally of things you do, or is it something you share with other people too? Well, years and years ago, I wrote something. In 1989, I was at a point in my legal career where I didn't have time to work on my cars anymore. Uh, so. A fellow Formula Ford racer from the San Francisco region, Stan Towns, was racing an identical car. And he started prepping my car. But he had a different final drive than I did. And I wanted to see how close we were on gearing. So I wrote something that would do that. And then I wanted to keep track of what the setup was. And so I wrote something that would do that. And that's evolved into some software, which uh, I have never made any effort to promote, but I still sell it. Um, it's, it's morphed into something quite different and more complicated. But aside from that, <clears throat> as you will probably show a slide later, I'm, the team I've been with basically since the end of 2007, Allegro Motorsports, we're, we're going to be back in professional racing full-time next year. And we're 
going to be going back into a series with a new car to us. We've been doing Porsches mostly, but we're going to be racing a Mercedes uh, AMG GT3. And so I've written software that sucks all of the um, CSV text files from the race results for IMSA and um, basically churns away and gives me a very, very comprehensive analysis statistically of a lot of everything that's going on in the series and specifically as it relates to the Mercedes. That's just for me and internal to the team. Yeah. Um, I brought up a slide of that car. I grabbed a couple of screen captures, just a couple of words out of uh, one of the press releases. Yeah, a, a pretty darn cool looking car, and uh, and but but way different than what, uh, as you mentioned, right? You've been working with uh, either open wheel cars or then you know Porsches, uh, you know, quite a bit uh, recently with Allegra. Um, you got a lot of work to do, right? I mean, you've got a you got a brand new car to you and to the team, and uh, and you need to set up everything that you do and in previous webinars we've talked about with a lot of data guys and 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 the, the the way that a lot of guys attack this is boy you get as much work done ahead of time all your preparation because time is a is is of such a shortage at the racetrack that when you take that car out on the track and they you come back in you you attach to it and grab the data boy you need to be able to do what you need to do with that data as quickly as possible to get information to the engineer the mechanics the drivers the entire team uh, how, how much work is ahead of you to get yourself prepared and ready to ready to start giving information? Well, I was going to talk about this in a somewhat different context, but okay. this car probably will not be substantially different than the Porsche GT3 cars that we've been running. There are 1,310 channels capable of being logged in the Porsche. The manufacturer <laughs> logs 1,190 of them. I generally have about 400 plus that I log. Many of those are engine and system channels, but you still need to have that information. I also have 208 math channels, events. Um, that's something that's sort of specific to Cosworth, but 61 events, 28 constants, and my workbook has 28 worksheets. And you say to yourself, this guy must be nuts, why? <laughs> and, and the answer is, I found out over the years that you are periodically confronted with a situation you've never had before. Something goes wrong and you need to figure out what it was. And then you find out that that sort of thing happens again. It may not happen very often, but so what I've done is as I solve a problem, I save the worksheet and I, whittle them down. Sometimes I save, save them external to my workbook and bring them back in. But one of the things you have to do is be prepared to find the answer as quickly as possible. And if you have to create a view of the data from scratch every time you have a new problem, you're not going to get the job done. It's really difficult. You're going to have a large group of people behind you waiting for an answer, right? At the yes, track. <laughs> yes, believe me. No, no um, pressure, no pressure. Right. So you need, you need to have a structured system for viewing the data. And I'm a firm believer in the idea that what you want to use is like a feeler gauge. It's go, no go. You can look at something and you don't have to look at a bunch of numbers in relation to each other. You can look at it and you know right away, this is a problem or it's not. And if it's not, I can move on to something else. The, the second part of that, and if you look in the book, I'm not trying to peddle the book, but if you look in my book, I have a bunch of sample data views with all the channels and all of the ranges and all of the things that you would need to construct a pretty comprehensive way of looking at the data. And once you've got it, all you do is load the load the event data and you're off and running. The other part of this, I think, and it's critical as well, is there's never enough time to get stuff done at the racetrack. And there are three people at my level, there are three groups of people who need answers for me like right now. One is the team manager and the lead mechanics on the cars. They need to know are there any problems that they need to address? The second is the race engineer, and the third is the driver or drivers. And so you, you need to prioritize how you look at the data. 
you have this nice system, you download the data, you have all your worksheets there so you can go just about anywhere you want to go with the click of a tab. But where do you start? The one thing that takes the longest to deal with is problems with the car, whether it's mechanical, electrical, whatever it might be. That's number one. And there are going to be times when you're going to have drivers hanging all over you saying, I want the data, I want the data. And you just have to be polite and say, you're going to have to wait because you've got to look at what's going on with the car. And here you simply need, everyone has a rep, an engine report kind of um, widget so that you end up with something that looks like a spreadsheet so that you have max RPM, max speed, max throttle position, minimum, mean, and max for all the pressures and temperatures. And the list really can go on and on. Uh, with the Porsche, I probably have 90 or 100 items that I need to look at. On but the thing is, I can, I can look at that, see if there are any issues, see if there are any trends that are bothersome. And so that information goes as quickly as possible to, to the team manager so that the guys can start working on stuff. To solve the problem with the drivers and the engineer, I've done all kinds of things, different kinds of USB sticks and the like, but the simplest, and I don't see why this won't work for uh, a, a three person team. I have an, I, we have um, a Wi-Fi hotspot so that we can get on the internet. I have a Wi-Fi router and an NAS drive and I download directly to the NAS drive. So anybody, anybody who's got, um, the correct password for our little network can log on. And at, at the professional level, most of the drivers know exactly what they want to see in the data. They already have their computers set up to do it. And so I don't have to spend a lot of time scurrying around um, trying to provide information to the people who need it. Yeah, it's a couple things there that uh, that tie in together. With with AIM, it's channel reports, right? That that is that uh, yes. is that is that piece. But the uh, we always talk about here is 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 it's really three things we're looking for. It's vehicle health, driver performance, vi vehicle performance, and you just hit on those three and with some different terms, right? And vehicle health being the thing that, you know, they, those the, those fellows need to know that information because there is nothing worse than a, as a data guy poking your head out of the trailer with, with 15 minutes before they roll out back to the grid and tell them they have a, have an alternator that's not outputting, you know, power. Uh, it, when you've been sitting looking at data for the driver for, for an hour, right? Looking at video and data. That I, is, I wouldn't it, have my job for very uh, long. It, you, exactly. So the, so we, uh, you are absolutely correct in my opinion is, boy, that's the number one thing. And sometimes we even, we even do that while, uh, you know, uh, just the moment it comes out of the car. If you're doing it Wi-Fi, maybe you're maybe you're in the in the in the truck or in your office. But but uh, for those of us who connect with a cable, the, the, the laptop sitting there, and I just run the report really quickly sitting there and be able to share that data, right? So yeah, well, interesting that you talked about that. I still have to plug into the car, but what I'm saying is that I set my download destination to be the NAS drive. There you go. Um, and so AIM has that ability, by the way, for if, if we're right. working in the Race Studio 3 now has that ability to set up uh, networks or just the, the single, you know, single car that a lot of people use that. But we do have that ability to do it the other but way. I, I would probably do that, you know, most of the time you're going to do your data downloads uh, by the trailer. So that's not a bad way to, to handle that problem. Another point I wanted to make, and I sort of lost it, but... Okay, you've done you've done your engine stuff, and now you're going to start looking at call it car performance, driver performance stuff. Um, where do you start with that? Often, often you hear stuff on the radio during the session, or if you sometimes this is a problem because the engineer is doing his debrief with the drivers while I'm downloading data, but I. If you have a good idea of what kind of issues came up from a performance standpoint uh, during during the session, you know, there's turn entry understeer and they've worked on the car and haven't figured it out. They haven't got it where they need it to be. That might be a place you'd want to start looking at first. But when you put all that aside, for me, the, especially for the, the team, it's one, one or two guys, the driver who is the data guy, the mechanic, and uh, the guy who makes the sandwiches, who's got all these things to do. Overlays are your best friend. Do overlays of three or four of your fastest laps from the 
session just to see if there are any kinds of trends that you see. Are you driving certain corners the same way every time? If not, you want to think about why not. But if you're driving them the same way, okay, take your best lap, overlay it against another lap that maybe isn't quite as good or a better lap from another session, and look at the compare time channel. And you can see right away, right away where there are one, two, generally not too many more, where there are big chunks of time lost. That's what you want to focus on. Yeah. Try to understand why. And that's what you work on for the next session. I have had sit downs, and this is on me, I've had sit downs with drivers where I've told them 12 things that they could have done better. <laughs> and that's just not the way to get it done. Yeah. Because nobody can focus on that much. Sometimes what you'll find is that um, they're driving similar corners in a similar way. So if you work on that, then you solve two problems or three problems or four problems. You always want to focus on the stuff that will gain you the most lap time if you can fix it. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, the, uh, the talking about your your method of of preparation or at track um, uh, work. Let, let's go on to the next uh, next couple of slides. You, it, <laughs> I found this pretty interesting. There's a. It might be outside of what some of our folks here that are watching might want to uh, to consider, but it. Uh, I love it when we when we open up our eyes to 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 some different ways of looking at it. And, and maybe this is for, you know, for some of the folks here. Let's chat just, you know, we got three or four slides here to talk about your, your methods and some things that you might have done in the past or you're gonna do in the, in the near future. Let's chat about these slides. Give us an idea of what we're looking at. Okay, let me give you a preface to this first. Um, we all spend a fair bit of time at the racetrack trying to make the contact patch the best it can be. I mean, that's what it's all about. So we take, Tire pressures, if we have a pyrometer or there's a, a tire manufacturer's rep there, they do the, the, the tire temps for you and so on. You read the wear on the tires because what you're looking for is what static settings do I need to have that will give me the most performance out of the tire. So far with the tire manufacturers that I've had anything to do with, and it's not that great a number, but they're all at the press professional level. They don't provide you with a huge amount of detail. They'll tell you, this is the camber range that you can run in. This is the pressure range. And if you go talk to the guy who mounts the tires, you'll say, well, a lot of the guys are running at 25 PSI. And that's sort of what you get. Um, there's another way. You can send one tire, two fronts, two rears to a tire testing facility. There's one located at um, VIR. And Allegra as a team um, sent a set of tires, gave them a set of tires. We happened to be there on the shaker rig at the same time, but gave them a set of tires um, and they tested them for us. And the end result was about a 30 page report. I don't know, I won't show you all of it, but the key things I think that we need to talk about are the graph in front of you if you read at the bottom, it says camber angle corresponding to the max peak cornering ratio for each weight and pressure. Okay, weight here has to do with the load on, on the corner. This happens to be a front. So we're talking about the static weight plus whatever weight transfer occurs because of the cornering. And they relate that as a ratio to their calculation of a cornering force, which is gonna be in pounds force, all right? So what they're saying in this graph is at tire pressures between 24 and 30 PSI in two PSI increments, we're going to show you the camber that we were running at when we developed the peak cornering force for that tire. And if you look at this, it doesn't take very long for it to jump out at you that 24 PSI if you look at the green trace and you see the you see how it's shaped compared to all the others 24 psi is going to be about where you want to start so if you go to the racetrack knowing that for this front tire 24 psi is your starting point it's not going to take you very long to figure out 
what works. As a matter of fact, when we did this, we actually had a test day the next day. We started at 24 PSI in the front and we ended up a little bit off that, but not by very much. If we go to the next slide. Okay. One of the other things that they do is that they used um, a, four different loads on the tire. Uh, the spread was a little bit bigger than we really needed. The car we're talking about here had about 600 pounds corner weight, static weight on the, on the front. And the weight transfer, that's a whole bunch of other calculations, but the load transfer was maybe 200 pounds force. So we're looking at numbers in the 600 um, to 800 pound range, all right? So there's a, if you look at this graph, what you see again is that at our uh, 24 uh, PSI tire pressure, that the peak camber is going to be somewhere between minus four and uh, about minus 4.5. And also the, the cornering ratio just between us guys, I kind of think what that represents is the vector value of the longitudinal later, lateral Gs, the square of the longitudinal plus the square of the lateral and the square root of that. Those numbers look surprisingly similar to <laughs> numbers that I see looking just at that in the data. So the point again here is now we know where our um, tire pressure ought to be within a pretty narrow range. And we can see what kind of uh, camber tolerance there is in this tire. And what you see there is uh, between about 3.5 degrees of negative camber and um, five degrees of negative camber at 24 PSI, there's only about a 1% change in grip. Interesting. And that, uh Go ahead. I know when I saw these slides the first time, it was it, it, it surprised me that, um, the, that there was this big of a consistent difference between the two. Then I noticed that the cornering ratios were actually fairly small. It's it scaled up a bit, but right. pretty darn consistent. Uh, with the, this two psi, which is a big change in 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 a, in a tire like this, but uh, you know, pretty consistently one direction. So well, but you can see that if you if. I think you can reasonably interpolate, say, for example, between the 24 and 26 PSI um, data at minus four degrees of camber, you can see that it represents something over 1% change in grip. Yep, yep exactly. Now, go to the next slide. Now, this is at lower loads, lower than we would actually run. And they did four data points, and I didn't give Roger all of them, but there's another one at a about 1,100 pounds force as far as the load's concerned. And it looks almost identical to the one at 670. So you, you get this data. And so we did two fronts. We did two rears. We get similar data for the rears. It's available to us in the graphic form, in tabular form, so that you can put that in lookup tables um, to do stuff inside the data analysis software. This was... Uh, well worth the time yeah. and for us at the level that, that we're running and the kind of budget that we have to, to run for a season, to do four tires and end up with this kind of information a couple of years ago was about $11,000. And you say, oh God, I can't do that. But if you're going into a series with tires you've never run or a car you've never run, um, this is, money well spent because you could go to the track, burn up three sets of tires um, and still not end up exactly where you need to be. And it's uh, not just the tire a... cost. It's, get, it's getting there. It's the wear and tear on the vehicle. It's the people. It, yeah. it, it adds up in a real big hurry. Well, and if you have a small team and you're running similar cars, or if you're running something in F3, F4, Spectre. Um, yeah. a team, the cost of doing this is, I think, small in comparison to the benefits that you get. Absolutely. So Very you cool. want to, let's move on to the next slide. Very cool. Okay. Um, this is um, one of my workbook pages. And what I want you to look at is over on the left side. 
you see two horizontal bars uh, at the top and then about halfway down, you see two more horizontal bars. And basically what that represents is uh, a calculation of dynamic camber. That is, I'm using the data system to tell me what the camber is in the, in the moment, in the corner. And you can, you can do a distance graph plot of this and you can see it, but it doesn't mean quite as much, I don't think, as if you see it this way. The colors represent, <clears throat> I, I consistently use red for left front anything and blue for right front anything, a slightly different version of red for left rear anything and a slightly different version of blue for right rear anything that way. I know what I'm looking at right away and the engineer isn't asking me, what am I looking at? Um, the uh, verticals are load calculations. But if you animated this and watched the car go around the racetrack, and you can tell most of you who know this, that's Watkins Glen we're looking at. If you animated this and ran it around, you could see the indicators on the horizontal bar graphs move. Um, and if you plot it out, um, what you'll find, if, if you go to the next slide. Okay, this represents a qualifying session, four laps, sticker tires. And if we look at the one in the upper left, that's the um, left front. And if you, what, what we're plotting here is dynamic camber on the horizontal axis and grip. And my grip factor is what I just talked to you about a, a moment ago, the vector value of the latitude. Um, longitudinal G's and oh, lateral, G's. Yep. lateral G's. And if you look, you can see that the peak is somewhere in, call it 4.2 to about 4.8 degrees of camber. So this is just sort of a, a sanity check. And you see the same thing in the right front. Um, the Rears uh, are not as peaky. Um, yeah, interesting. Well, what that tells you, and if I had put up those graphs as well, that would tell you that it's a bit more camber tolerant. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, the sweet spot limits. is bigger, right? The sweet okay. spot is bigger. So right? I, I know I'm wasting a lot of time here. So the, the whole point is you can actually, if you don't want to spend $11,000 in the cost of a set of tires, to do this, you can get, as you can see, similar information by doing mass channels that calculate dynamic camber. And there isn't a data system out there that can't do this. Mm -hmm. So how do you do it? You have static camber, that's where you start. You add to that the camber change from the suspension movement. Mm -hmm. In the front, you also add the camber change that comes from steering because of the kingpin inclination. And then you have, and those are all negative numbers. Right. So you're as you add these things in, you're going more and more negative. Um, and then the last, if you think about sort of a schematic of a chassis and the suspension, when the car rolls, the inboard pickup points move. Uh, the top inboard pickup point, which affects what happens at the top of the wheel, the top inboard pickup point moves in and down, and the uh, bottom pickup point moves. Um, I mean, it moves out and down and the lower one moves in and down. And so you have to, as a reasonable approximation, you have to add back in the roll. So static camber, camber change from suspension movement in the front, uh, camber change from steering, and then add the roll back in. And some race car manufacturers will supply you with camber change from suspension movement, but it's not... I'm sure all of you can see how it would be done in the shop. Um, what you need to do is move, um, get the car up in blocks, move it from like minus 50 millimeters in droop to plus 50 millimeters or more if you have a lot more roll and just read with a camber gauge what the camber is. And as far as steering is concerned, if you have steering plates, you can use those. If you've used steering plates to create a math channel that gives you steered angle, which I recommend you all use instead of steering wheel angle, you can read the camber as you turn the wheel in fixed increments. And you can either put those in lookup tables, but a better way, I think, because I don't think it takes as long 
to calculate the math channels is you can plug in all of these input output pairs that you have input being steered angle and output being camera change and so on. You can go online and find uh, websites that have best fit calculators or trend line calculators. Best fits gives you a straight line. Trend line will give you some kind of equation that's a little more complicated. And you just plug in the equation into your math channel and substitute. And Go ahead. And that and that works with AIM because in the in the math channels and uh, and I'll link uh, later in the description box. Uh, Emiliano, who who is here in the background, he um, he co-hosted with us on a on a. Uh, you send us your math channels or ask us how to fix some some things you wanted. And somebody wanted dynamic camber, and uh, and we've got a little piece on how to do that in the AIM math channel functions. So. But in any case, this this is a useful tool. Um, Obviously, it's not the same as doing a tire test because here um, you have to really keep good track of what your tire pressures are so that you can relate these because um, they're going to shift slightly. Uh, but it's a great, camera. as you said, it's a great sanity check for the data that you've got as well. And then have a, a process in place for the next time. Maybe there's a tire change in the middle of the year or, you know, something you need to double check against it. Then you have some, a, a way to use your data to get to, you know, some backup yeah. information. So perfect. Perfect. A couple of questions that we'll, 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 we'll slide in now before we jump in and talk a little bit uh, more in depth about the book, but um, do you ask your driver early at, 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 when you first start chatting with the driver? This is more of a process of, of your uh, attacking data analysis steps. Uh, what is holding you back you know, in, 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 as a question? Or And he may say low speed push, motor is not pulling hard. Or is it something that you look at that time compare bar and you find out where he's losing time and you and then you do the old one of our key phrases here around here is what happened where did it happened why did it happen i well, think it's a bit of a bit of both right you get the driver feedback and you you do it from the data well when i first started doing this stuff back in 2004 and i was working with really small you know scca club racing teams or with a prep shop or whatever um and I don't cr take credit for this, but Gib Gibson said, can you put together something that asks people the following questions? What kind of corner is this? Slow, medium, fast? What, and I want you to rate on a scale of one to five in entry, middle and exit, what you have, understeer or oversteer. And I wanna have that, first thing you do when you climb out of the car driver is you do that and you give it to me give it to Gibby. Um, with, with when I was working like in uh, USF 2000 or F 2000 with really young drivers, some of them just coming out of go-kart, it was, it was a little bit different process. Uh, sometimes it took a, it took a while uh, to get so that we had the same voc vocabulary and talk about the same things. Um, at the pro level, those guys know what they want and know what they need. There's not a whole lot I can, I can add to what they do, but I think it's critical that the driver, even if he's doing his own data analysis, sit down, take the time to figure out what's happening on the racetrack. Um, because some of the times you will see that there, that similar corners have similar comments. Sometimes they don't. And usually when they don't, it's because the driver is not driving them consistently. When they're similar, that doesn't mean the driver is still doing it right. It just means whatever is going on, whether it's setup or driver, is happening in both places. Yeah, the, the, the consistency of the driver and the consistency of the feedback uh, makes your data analysis task a, a whole lot easier, right? You, you, it's yes. that needle in the haystack. If all you've got is 20 laps and the driver says the car's not good, well, that, okay, well, I can't give you an answer in 15 minutes, right? Well, <laughs> I mean, I can, I can tell you that it sort of depends on the engineer. Last year, we were running two cars. We had two engineers. Um, and there was quite a difference in their approach to this, but one of them, um, these were Porsche factory drivers. They were required to fill out a sheet like the one we just talked about and or a track map that was annotated with their comments because the engineer wanted to have that. He wanted to be able to, to analyze what was going on. So I think it's critical, yeah. 
and it also, by the way, I have, I, I have also used that method uh, or seen that method used with teams that I, I was around. And if you get to the driver before they have a lot of time to talk with other people, other drivers, other things <laughs> that you, you get the, you get what's on their mind right as they come out of the car instead of uh, getting tainted a little bit with, uh, with others' experiences. Absolutely. So it, 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 doing that as fast as possible. And the other thing that we use in, in our little world with uh, when my son was racing and I was on the radio doing the data and the engineer, you know, a small family team uh, as, as, we what we kind of followed was another thing we had our smarty cam video and we had the input from the radio going to it and as he got the checkered flag as he was doing his cool down lap he would walk talk his way around the track right a little pause on the straightaways obviously but you know hey on entry here this is what i've been fighting and you know this it, it always gets loose right here and you know whatever it happens to be right we we did that with an audio recording and onto the onto the video itself which was uh sometimes his time the driver's times are taken away from you they they have to go do x y and z right and you don't get the driver right away especially at the end of the day and uh that was another way that we did it as well so very important. Uh, we do have one other question there, but Jim, I think I'm going to push that one off. Is there a method to translate AIM roll data, roll rate data to camber gain or loss in degrees? There is some some ways to do that, but I think uh, a little outside of the scope of what we're we're doing here, at least for uh, for a deep explanation for that. So uh, well, let, let's chat about that one at uh, at some point in the future. Uh, I do like the question though. There is a there is a math channel component there that I think uh, we've we've touched around the edges for so far today. So. Bob, let's 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 talk a little bit about the book. And uh, um, uh, I wanted to just uh, yeah, a few things. I, I, one thing I do realize is you wrote this book in 2010, I suppose it became for sale in 2011. It's not something that you live with uh, live with every day. So we're not going <laughs> to ask you a question about you know something on page 192. But but uh, but bigger picture stuff. I I, I really. Um, I find that it's a very good book for our core group of people that are here today. It's a it's a practical guide. It's 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 there's a process that is followed in the way you wrote the book. It follows a nice process. I just wanted to show the front cover uh, and the back cover, give people a, a feel of what it looks like. It would be interesting to see how many people uh, are already have it. But uh, um, this is what the book looks like. You know, I, I wanted to give a little bit of uh, a, a, an idea of what is in the table of contents. And the um, uh, on the right here is is the basic table of contents. He he goes through a introduction and then a data analysis basics. And um, and, and you can kind of see the uh, over on the left edge, you know, speed plots, longitudinal Gs, lateral Gs, throttles. It, it goes through what are the basics, how do you use them? The book is really really clear about with lots of lots of graphs and and tables uh and many of them uh following with aim examples uh you use aim uh, you use motec uh, i2 pro you use pi toolbox and stack data pro and you give examples of all four of those pieces of software all the way through it and uh, which is very very helpful and um the next level dampers uh, potentiometers, bre brake and clutch pressures, more back that one in a minute, more math channels, putting it all together, and then some appendixes in the back that uh, gives all the actual math channels in, in all four of those forms of, of software, including AIM, obviously. Uh, time compare bar, you talk about how to use that. You mentioned that briefly a second ago. And then and then some checklists, which a lot of people I have found really love about the book. It Hey, here's something that, yeah, you don't put your finger on this and walk your way through everyone, but it's a good basic process of walking your way through uh, that the table of contents. Just give some, those of you that don't have the book, a little bit of an idea. The other thing that I really, really like is there's there's an index. I just grabbed a couple of different pages from it. There, the index is like six or seven pages long. But but um, when I'm using the book, I read it, like as I mentioned, the first time through. I got a copy of it sitting right here next to me. When I, I, I read it through, and then it goes into my backpack. And as I am walking around the, the paddock area, maybe showing some different people some different things or asking, answering questions, or I'm working with a team and I'm, I'm actually doing some, some actual work. And if I'm looking for something where you talked about, you know, a, a handling page and how to use steering versus lateral Gs in an XY plot, you know, there it is. I can go to page 129 and, uh, and find it in, in the book, right? The index to me is a very, very handy thing. I, you, you put a lot of work into, uh, in, into taking care of that for everybody. So that's, that's pretty cool. Overall, 
the way that the book writes is is almost a, a, a day in the life of a data guy. Is 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 that the way that you uh, envisioned it? I, I know the opening page does talk about, hey, I I, I was I was I'm, I'm in this position, and I'm looking for a way to give some help for brand new guys that are just using this, buying it, and then and then you uh, starting to use it. You did that on purpose, it looks like. Well. When I first started doing this, I was, as I said, working for, you know, uh, club racers, you know, the driver and a couple other people, F2000, similar situations. And I got hired a bunch of times uh, to come and work for a weekend uh, with a small team. And they had a data system, but really didn't know how to use it. And I would spend a lot of time Go, I would give them um, a basic setup, that is a, a data analysis setup, all of the a workbook with all the pages and so on. Um, and we would go through that. I would talk them through how to do everything from setting it up to download, on and on. And got a lot of, yeah, got that, got that. And then I'd see them two weeks later at another race and I'd go over and say, Fred, how you doing? And I'd see that they were back to where they were using their data system to read RPM and temperature and pressure. And I realized that uh, either I was a terrible teacher uh, or this was just too much for most people to absorb in a short period of time. Verbally, so, especially, right? There were a few seminars out there, primarily Chris Brown doing MoTeC. That was really all about all there was. You have filled a very, very, very big void with what you've been doing. So one day in an airport with time to kill between planes, I just started jotting down an outline. What do I, how do I explain this to people? And I would add to that from time to time. And it was two or three sheets of legal size, you know, from a legal pad, yellow lined paper. And those poor sheets of paper followed me around in my computer case for several years and just languished. And, um, both Gibby and Joe Stamola basically said the same th thing to me about the same time, which was get off your butt <laughs> and do something with this. And so we'd finished the 2010 season. Um, for us, it ended on a big high. We, we, Allegra was doing F2000 that year and we won a championship. And I didn't really have anything going until the first of the year. So I just sat down and brute forced my way through it. And I, I will tell you that I had a lot of help from people. Joe Atkinson, who's out there listening, was one of them. Um, offering suggestions. And I remember I was all done with the analysis stuff. And another one of my friends, An Angelo Zara from ANSA Suspension, said, OK, but, but what do we do with it? I hadn't really thought about that. So that's why you have uh, a fairly deep discussion about the process because somebody said, we need to know about how to do this. Uh, so that, that was basically the process. I would say that it took me uh, about 30 to 40% of the time was spent writing because I knew what I wanted to say. The rest of the time was hunting through hundreds and hundreds of data samples, yeah, <laughs> trying to find an example of something that I knew I had seen, but I didn't remember where it was. Yeah, and, and, uh, and putting it all together, that you know, that's probably that chapter you were talking about, right? You you you, you had some basic information. Okay, now how do we you know, how do we do it, right? And that's a that's a very interesting chapter where you actually walk through some interesting uh, examples. One one of the best examples I saw, and it, and it, it comes back. And it, the reason it even rang a bell even more for me was uh, a few weeks ago we had Tommy Kindle on, and and one of the things he talked about what was most important to him in data. Uh, in his driving style, and then finding it and using data to do it was was breaking. It, you know, uh, under under uh, analyzed piece of of what most people are looking at, and you spend a pretty good chunk of time uh, showing some good examples of breaking and and how how you can number one just the actual act of breaking, how you apply it, how you release, and then the the heel and towing part, and being able to see some problems in the braking channel. Uh, give us a little bit of a, a an idea of where you rate that in the in the areas that. Uh, you think are important of data analysis? Well, this is going to sound strange. Uh, a lot of drivers think that the way to get better lap times is, is to drive, drive as deep into the corner as possible and pound as hard as they can. That's true up to a point. Um, but you have to think of braking as two things. 
it's basically getting the car in a position to maximize the corner that's coming up. Because I, th I always think of road racing as comprised of two things, corners, which are essentially steady state, and then drag races to the next corner. Um, gearing's the whole thing about the drag race, but I think to do the corners properly, braking is critical in terms of how you do it. Um, even, even now I have to remind myself and in a gentle way sometimes remind some of, some of the professional drivers that we deal with when we start having some issues is that slow in fast out still really works. That doesn't mean you over slow the car, but it means that you slow it down to the, to absolutely the right velocity that will allow you to turn in, apply the throttle and get back out. I see if you do overlays, I see sort of two different views. One where somebody breaks really, really, really late and then tries to turn in camp, has to wait on the throttle and they lose a bunch of time. Or somebody else who breaks early, tries to roll a lot of speed into the corner, but it's too fast. They're late on the throttle and they lose a bunch of time. Um, the cars that I'm used to dealing with for the last number of years all have ABS. And the Porsche factory drivers and a lot of other drivers, they just bury their feet. 2000 PSI on the brake pedal. They're, they're into the ABS and when they think it's time, they release the brake pedal and they turn the car. Another one of our drivers, his view is that when you're on the ABS, the thing is constantly cycling. And every time, every time it applies the brakes a little bit more and releases, you're losing grip. And so he's really trained himself to get up close to the ABS threshold limit. For him, it's around 15,600 PSI. And you look at his brake traces and he's, a, he's as good or better in the brake zone as the guys who are using the ABS, but they all do the same thing. Interesting. They don't kind of come up to the corner, roll off the gas, think about it a bit, wait and say, okay, I guess it's okay now to put the brakes on. They, they pick their points and they are at max brake pressure with usually less than two tenths of a second. And they, they immediately start releasing. Yeah, exactly, and and the, and and start the turn in and the roll through and 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 that whole you know second two thirds of the corner, right? So. Well, it just it depends. It depends on the tire. It depends on the corner. Um, some one particular driver will, other things being equal, not trail brake, but when he feels that it's appropriate, he will. Um, not huge, but you can see it in a very slight tail off under a hundred psi. Um, you just have to adjust what you do. But braking's critical. I had a good question here from uh, from Bruce. Uh, Bob, when first starting, how did you make sense of the data or did you, how did you make sense of the data full stop? But did you have an uh, epiphany or did you slowly work your way into understanding data in, in the way that you, uh, you can now? Well, the very first time I ever had anything to do with data, back in the mid to late 80s, there was one data system that was available kind of at the club racing level, Data Commander. They, those things were hugely expensive. $3,000 these days doesn't seem like much, but back yeah. then that was 10 sets of tires. Yeah. And uh, a couple of guys in California came up with something called Race Log, and it was just a logger. And it had enough inputs that we could have a linear pot for throttle, we could have brake pressure, we had a two axis G sensor, we had something for steering. And he also took RPM off um, the ignition system. And that's what we had. And we had, and we had one wheel speed sensor. And at that time, I, as I said, I was racing with a good friend and we had identical cars except for the final drive ratio. And we put these things in our car, they were about 600 bucks a piece and did an overlay. And it was sort of like, it's not the light bulb went on. It was like the universe was filled with light <laughs> because right away it was like, what are you doing there? How did you get that time? And he'd say, well, what are you doing there? And it made us both better and faster. And for me, it was an eye opener. And I had one of those things in my cars until the last race I did in 1994. Interesting. And so when I started, 
again, you know, doing data sort of as a data guy, that I think that the prep shop that I was at, they had a couple of cars with Evo 3s. Then we moved to MXLs. Um, and it was, there was one book by Buddy Fay, Data Power, which was 20 years out of date even then. Um, and really hard to find. It was no longer in print. And it, and it has some really basic stuff. Mm -hmm. And the way, because I had driven so much before getting to that point, I had a fair understanding of what it felt like to be in the car when all these things were happening. And what happened when you twisted this knob or turned that, turned the steering wheel, changed gears, or pressed on that, this pedal or the other. And so I began to, began to see patterns in the data. And that's something I would encourage people to do is don't be afraid to experiment. Um, I came across the lateral G's versus um, steering input just by reading something that got me thinking about using XY plots. And I did it and I had no idea what it meant, but I kept looking at it, looking at it, talking to the drivers. And it got to the point where the two Brazilian kids I had in 2009 and 2010, the first thing they wanted to see was, I want to see the G plot. I want to see the G plot <laughs> because it was so graphic. Yeah. I mean, it didn't require yeah. you to, to interpret numbers, nothing. We did Don't a, be afraid. To... Yeah, we, we, did a, we did a webinar just the other day with, uh, with um, James Colburn that talked about learning styles and different ways of looking at things, right? A, a squiggly line versus that XY plot versus a, a channel table. Um, in, interesting that you found that fairly early. Well, one last thing, we're running out of time a little bit, but um, one of the questions that, um, and we'll get to Joe's here in just a second. The uh, what's I get this question a lot, and I know that you get it a lot, and I just wanted to talk about it here. What what uh, what important what sensor data is critical? We have that, if you, to get 100% of what you want, of course there's you know 400 sensors out there to do all sorts of things, but to get that 90% range, right? Where you get most of what uh, an amateur low level pro driver uh, team uh, engineer would want to do, what, what's important to you, RPM speed and, and the list? What, 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 what's important, well, what would you need if you were gonna do this? Well, as I said in, in the book, nothing's changed. A minimum system, has steering, lateral and longitudinal Gs, throttle position, and RPM. You can kind of do a lot with that, but it's the results are kind of crude. What you really need is, especially if you have a fairly high performance car, you need four wheel speed sensors. Um, a three axis G sensor is not a bad thing. Um, brake pressure sensors, front and rear. Uh, and the most amazing sensor ever developed for a race car is a damper potentiometer because the <laughs> things that you can do with four pots on the car are just amazing. It um, really shows you what that platform is doing from all those rest of those inputs we just talked about, right? Well, but you, you not only have just damper position, you can look at, you can calculate ride heights because you use the motion ratio to figure out what the wheel's doing in relation to the chassis. You can calculate loads. You can calculate dynamic cambers. Yeah. Pitch uh, and roll. Pitch, roll, yeah. And then you can, do, you can look at, seeing roll gradients is a big thing and you can look at front and rear roll combined. And that just sort of touches the surface of what you're able to do. I mean, I've, I've worked with cars that had uh, load sensors on them. Um, frankly, found them not that great because after you go through the calibration and then you go back and start putting weight on the car, I was never within 35 pounds on anything. Mm -hmm. And so I, and, and our race engineer never thought much of them as well either. <laughs> we use laser ride height sensors. And in the end, we abandoned them. Um, because they're expensive and yes, they do provide you with information, but from a practical standpoint, it wasn't information that was critical to anything we were doing. Yeah. Cool info, but, uh, in the end you weren't able to, to turn that into speed, I suppose. Right. So yeah, uh, basically interesting. interesting. Well, the thing, the other thing about all of this is it's sort of like the you know, medicine, they talk about triage. You need to be able to log and show quickly an incredible array of data but you don't need to focus on all of that every time. The whole point here is to have access to it in a hurry if you need it, but at the same time, focus on the things that are gonna return the biggest benefit for the least amount of time. 
all, all very it, since time is so limited yeah, that the, it, it always comes down to that at the racetrack right so absolutely very cool very cool I, I wanted to jump up and uh and give everybody an idea of where to where to get this it is at my guess is it's at some print uh, at some prep shops and 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 some of your online uh, dealers uh, i didn't go through a bunch of that it may well be available the uh again i i have enjoyed this book i have thought it was a, a wonderful addition to the library and and uh, and it has helped me tremendously what you just mentioned about the suspension and adding of the motion ratios and the uh, the pitch and the and the roll and all of that from you know from the the four wheel uh, shock sensors uh, it was something i i put into play very very quickly after reading your book and i still have those math channels uh, stored in my general tab and in my aim uh, software so it, it is something that i use a lot you can go out to um um the to amazon and buy the book everybody there's uh there is a link the guys will probably link it again for a direct link to this to this page if it's something you might be interested in it, it's out there it's available uh, you, you print uh, the, the, they're available very quickly so it's uh, uh ready for you to grab uh, and I appreciate that. The um, uh, one one last question. We are at that point, and I'm going to start to kind of wrap it up. But I did have one question to, that I did want to move into. You were an open wheel racer. I'm going to jump back to that screen just to hold it there. You, you were an open wheel racer, and you uh, now your 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 focus is on, on the Mercedes that we talked that we showed earlier, or the the Porsches in the past. The um, data analysis coming from an open wheel guy to a a production based you know very very nice race cars but production based car with front engine versus mid engine in the open wheel car using data to uh have you had to relearn some things or is 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 data is data and you just apply it in different ways uh, uh, we have people here that are off-road racers motorcycles carters there's a, we we have a wide range of folks rally cars uh, uh Give me a, just your, your 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 one or two minute look at using data across many many different forms of motorsports. Well, I mean the basic thing here is the physics that are involved in what's going on in a race car are not any different between an open wheel car and a closed wheel car. I mean for a long time, even after I started working with these um, racing sedans, was you know real race cars don't have fenders. But I really come to appreciate how sophisticated things like the Porsche GTD or the Mercedes. I worked for a team for a while that ran some Aston Martins. Uh, I really come to appreciate how sophisticated those cars are, but you wanna know the same things about them from the data system. Uh, the magnitude of things is gonna change. Um, you know, how much is too much in one kind of car isn't gonna be the same in another, but the basic principles are still the same. You wanna look at all of this stuff and you are gonna see um, the same kinds of trends in data, whether it's open wheel or closed wheel, and you're going to see the same problems show up regardless. Interesting. Okay. I, I, I agree with you. It's uh, it, the, the physics are all there. If you're applying this to an off-road truck versus a, 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 a Mercedes GT3 car, clearly you're going you're gonna to focus on some different things, but the process is, is, is almost exactly the same. The, um, the one last thing, there is one, one, one question while I'm on this page before we close it down. Will there be a digital version of the book or is there already, Bob? There is not. And I thought about it at the beginning and decided not to do that and not to do it as a PDF because it was simply too, too easy for the, the book to find itself out there on yeah. the, the larger internet. Um, yeah. And I didn't write it to make money, honestly. I, I wrote it because I thought there was a need for something. It turns out it makes me a, a modest amount of money every year, but I'm not prepared to see it just go out and be yeah. available to anybody who wants to rip it off. Well, it has been a very, very good product for a, for a lot of people, including almost everybody that's on our uh, that, that has joined us here in our in our webinars. And I and I appreciate that you took the time to do it. I know it's not something that you uh, work inside of every day. So, but I'm glad that you were uh, you, you were you made yourself available to come here and chat about it. At, uh, I I do appreciate that. Let's kind of cl start closing this up a little bit. 
this video will be up on internet uh, up on our YouTube site here in just in the next couple of hours and, uh, and a lot of the links that we talked about will uh, will, will, will be uh, put together and put underneath it as well. Uh, go visit our YouTube site uh, all of our webinars plus plus a uh, hundred other videos of, of, of different things that uh, are available for you out there and it's we have 125 videos and it's growing every week so uh, go out and take a look. The um, uh, customer support. We've got uh, a couple of our guys that are normally here are out doing some customer support stuff right now. We look forward to seeing you every weekend out at the track. We we uh, we live there as much as you guys do, and uh, during the week, or if you can't, you don't. You, we're not at a racetrack that you're at. Give us a call at 800-718-9090. Uh, let us give us give us a chance to help you uh, make make this as easy as possible for you. Uh, we we do realize it's a uh, it's a fairly complex thing, and we're out here to give you uh, give you as much of help as possible. So the um, Let's talk about our next webinar. Our next webinar is, is John Block is going to come back on, on Thursday. John's going to come back in uh, for his second webinar that he's joined us with. And uh, he's going to talk about data sampling rates, something that uh, you know Bob touched on a couple of times there, but uh, we're, we're certainly going to talk about it in much more depth. We're going to remove the mystery. John's going to has, has put together a pretty cool presentation talking about how to how to recognize when uh, what your sampling rate should be. And then we've got some documents that uh, that we'll probably share you know, with some suggested numbers. But uh, Bob's going to go a little deeper into talking about what are they? What is it all about? Why would you want you know, a different sampling rate on a battery voltage versus a shock pot and you know, those extreme examples, but uh, and, and everything else in between. So everybody uh, look forward to seeing you all here on Tuesday, you know, just a couple of days away. I'm sorry, on Thursday, a couple of days away. And, uh, and when we invite uh, and have John Block back with us, he's a, he, he's a great guy and really enjoy chatting with him. So the um, uh, to kind of close it all up, Bob has made his uh, email address here available uh, for you to, to contact him with other questions that you might have. The um, uh, uh, Again, Bob, I, I, sh I sure appreciate it. I know it's a lot of work to come in here and do these kind of things and, and taking some of your valuable time. Uh, you know, maybe we bring you back in, uh, in, in, a, in a couple of months or something. We'll, we'll have to see. I know you're uh, fixing to get pretty busy and uh, as, we, uh, as we move into the new season. So anything else you'd like to add, Bob, as we kind of close this one up? No, I, it's been fun doing this. I'd love to do it again. Um, data is your friend. Make the most use of it you can. It will make you a better mechanic. It will make you a better driver. And it will get you on the podium if you work hard enough at it. It'll, it, it will really help in all different forms uh, of all the different things you do inside of this crazy sport of motorsports, won't it? To make you a better engineer, driver, crewman, every, everything. By having more information without good information, you you know, bad info in, bad info out, right? So it's uh, it, having the right information is, is an important thing. So... I appreciate you being here, Bob. I, I, I've, been, I've enjoyed chatting with you. It's, uh, it, it's been a good time. Hope, hopefully we can do it again in the future, like we mentioned. The, um, uh, everybody else, thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Hope you found this one uh, interesting. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it's the first in two, hopefully talking with many of the different uh, authors and maybe some high-end engineering, uh, race car engineers uh, from all around the world. We're gonna, we're gonna have some folks in and, and uh, chat about these things in the next few weeks. So look forward to seeing you all here. It'll, it'll be a good time. Thanks everybody for coming. Look forward to seeing you on Thursday and uh, and everybody have a good good afternoon and the next couple of days and we'll see you on Thursday.